you know, are, are we sowing the seeds in 2023? Because let's remember, Barbie is in many ways a subversive feminist movie dressed up as a kid's doll movie. So this is like a redo. Uh, again, this is basically uh, what I'm doing right now is that uh, we are going through uh, some of the good things that happened in 2023 and some of the bad things that happened in 2023 and kind of recap it, recap four bad things and four good things before we uh, hop on to the next year. However, we are already in, in the first week and finishing the first week of uh, the new year. So it's quite apt. So this is basically, uh, it, it should be like, I, I I would love it to be short and sweet because I am hoping that 100 years from now, if somebody is looking back, they can like just look at your slide, uh, one or two slides and get a gist of what, what happened in 2023 and if anything important happened. All right. And, and so... We did this live in 2023 at the the very cusp of 2024 on the 31st, and we had Andrew Rosenthal and a, about a dozen guests. Unfortunately, the audio was uneven, and so we're going to just do a brief rehashing of some of these themes with just us. We're not inviting others to repeat what we've already done. Sophia, you want to start us out with question number one? Uh, actually, uh, so the first question is, was 2023 the year humans lost control of AI? And my short answer to this, because we're keeping things brief right now, is no, in, in, in the sense that AI is not sufficiently uh, advanced or independent that we need to worry about controlling it in 2023. But I think what we're witnessing is commercial dynamics to employing this new, promising, powerful, but also potentially quite dangerous technology that, that are hostile to, or at least very difficult to regulate. And, and so AI is everywhere. And in many respects, it has been. If you use Google, if you use Amazon, if you use electronic banking or GPS or smartphones for a decade, but now we're starting to use it directly, right? And and so, Sophia, you're using it to spell check your copy and your colleagues are using it to write their first drafts of their medical reports my colleagues may be using it to grade their papers etc and so on and and so it's everywhere now and 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 for people our age it may be a little bit less obligatory to use but but for my college students they absolutely have to use it know how to use it and and so it worries me given how inept we've been at regulating new technological developments there's a, a new report from the American Surgeon General indicating that there's a mental health crisis, especially for girls and young women, that is directly related to social media use, that social media in many ways is akin to tobacco in terms of its addictive nature and its potential side effects, and yet we don't regulate it at all. It worries me with AI, a technology that literally could take control of i so find your slide very interesting Go and, ahead. um i uh, do agree that uh, ai may not we may not have lost control of ai but i do uh feel that we uh can't compete with it however we can use it um with our lives and it has made my life so much easier just in proofreading and in suggesting edits uh, to what we write it's not very good when it comes to writing uh, or write uh, or coming up with an original thought it is very good in some formats but for example like medical note taking and stuff 
which are more clerical kind of work, like, or maybe I, I am very sure that it will be very good for grading your papers. Uh, and you can ask it to grade it again if you don't agree with it. Uh, and it's going to make it easier for, uh, because it's, I, I feel that it has so much uh, information that it just pops for you, but it's not that great yet. And I think it's only in its uh, infancy and the potential for it is just too great for us to comprehend at this point. And as you can see, right, these are developments that occurred this year, right? And, and, and one way to put this is that now ChatGPT can get into college, get into graduate school, and go to law school and become a lawyer, right? Can pass the bar. Or it can get into medical school and yep. become a doctor, pass the USMLEs. And, and I don't obviously literally mean that, but in terms of its capacity and the speed at which it is learning, it is tremendous. Why don't we push on to issue two? So 2023 was the hottest year ever. Is climate change accelerating enough to be a problem? Yeah, and, and, and so we are, you may be able to see in Sophia's background, looking at the first snow falling in the New York City area in almost two years, right? And I was talking with friends about how we used to have snow so high that it was over your shoulders, right? You know, the, 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 when it had been plowed. Um, and, and obviously this is anecdotal, but what we do know is in, in, in both in terms of the months and in terms of the overall trend line of the year, 2023 was the hottest year ever recorded, 175 years of fairly precise measurements, a couple hundred thousand years of ice rings to compare it with. And yes, it does seem clear climate change is taking hold and it's impacting us. Well, I do remember in 2023 in New York, this, um, this, this, uh, you know, I, you have a picture of it also. Uh, where we had to mask up because there the the weather outside was so toxic, you can't couldn't see anything. Everything was yellow. It felt as if I was in some sci science fiction movie, um, and that was because of the fires that were going on in uh, another part of the world, a neighboring country, Canada. Yeah, yeah. So so and and we're seeing massive uncontrolled mega fires, right? Sweeping California, Colorado, much of Canada. And they're so big, we can't even put them out, right? And and, and we're seeing droughts and we're seeing monsoon rains. Did, and, and we're seeing hurricanes. did humans experience this even previously? It's just that now we get news much faster. Well, so here's, I think the interesting thing looking at the history of humanity. You know, something like Homo sapiens sapiens have been around for at least several hundred thousand years, but agriculture, urban living, civilization, written language, world religions, that stuff's all less than 3,000 years. And what happened within the last 10,000 years is that the climate stabilized and 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 it's a complex account of why it happened, but we've been in this very narrow band of temperatures for the last 10,000 years, when the temperature swings more widely, you can't stay put in one place because very quickly it may become too hot or too cold to stay there and you're going to have to migrate someplace where you can actually live. And that interferes with building a civilization with building its infrastructure with building agriculture with building cities and and so yes humans have lived have survived radical swings in climate but not the kind of human beings we are right this is uh migratory humanity humanity that never really developed culture or civilization because they had to pick up and go uh, within decade of the climate changing. And that's not where we want to live or how we want to live. By the way, at those periods in human history, there might have been, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of us, not 
billions of us. And, and one of the things that's so worrisome is if we continue on this trajectory, it's unclear how the planet will be able to sustain, sustain the number of human beings we currently have. And, and I, I, I want to emphasize good news where there is good news. And I think there is good news on this this year, which, which is on the one hand, the recently concluded COP conference seems to have said out loud some of the stuff that needed to be said that hadn't been said at previous conferences. We have to move away from fossil fuels. We have to rapidly transition to sustainable, energy sources and we'll just have to see is the political will present to follow through on the pledges that were made in the uae a couple months ago uh it, it's a lot easier to do that in 2023 because the cost of sustainable energy has come down but let's be honest about this this is perhaps the most ambitious transition in human history to decarbonize our now post-industrial economies. It, it's going to be a AI huge... will uh, help us make some, uh, you know, come up with some solutions for us, maybe? Well, one possible solution, which, which we don't know how to do cheaply and at scale right now, is to start pulling some of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, right? That's the most important greenhouse gas. And um, if AI helps us to do that, wow, wonderful, you know, really important. But until AI helps us to do that or, or helps us to figure out how to store solar and wind energy when the sun's not shining the wind's not blowing right that's the problem with the the sustainable energy sources is they don't uh tend to work 24 7 they tend to work cyclically um ai can maybe help us to do that but i don't think we should rely on these problems having easy solutions we have to also anticipate that we may need to change more fundamental things about our economy, our ways of life, the, the kinds of things we consume, the patterns of life we lead. Uh, is 2024 the beginning of the end of the modern liberal democracy, especially in the United States? Yes. And, and, and so we're speaking on January 7th, the mm -hmm. third anniversary of January 6th was yesterday. And, and I want to start with, with the idea that on as, as a global trend, the kind of democratic society the United States prides itself in having is in the retreat, right? And, and, and uh, whereas 20 years ago, it was ascending, today it is clearly declining, whereas 20 years ago, more autocratic forms of government seem to be retreating in, in light of, on the one hand, the collapse of the Soviet Union, on the other, the Arab Spring and other seemingly peaceful revolutions in a democratic direction. Today, right, the, the, the forces of autocracy are ascending. So we, we then add to that, right, that, that it may seem peculiar. This is the, the lecture that will be posted on Minerva tomorrow or the day after that that um january 6th right the, the this event that happened three years ago seems like it's going to be the dominant event or the dominant issue in the 2024 presidential election right and the question is going to be do the american people want to elect a candidate for the presidency who the last time he was president and lost an election tried to overturn the results of that election Can you tell me what, who are these people in this slide who is this guy who, who is this yes. yeah that's the, the special prosecutor who is bringing the case against trump in the federal courts for yes. overturning the election and also the picture right under there i just want to understand the slide i mean you've oh so the, these are the documents 
these are the documents that Donald Trump retained at Mar-a-Lago that by law he was supposed to return to the federal government. That's one of the four criminal cases that he faces. And, and one of the big questions is going to be, will these cases actually proceed in 2024? And therefore, will the verdicts of juries of Trump's peers be available to the electorate before we make up our mind about whether or not Donald Trump should be the next president of the United States. On the slide, I see uh, there's a rally with Trump signs, and then are the people fighting? What is this? The yeah, one is like, and what is this? The, these this is the rally on January sixth, and these are the people invading the Capitol, and these are the members of Congress who are assembled on the Capitol as the electoral college to determine who the next president of the united states is going to be and this is them sheltering in place as that crowd invades the capitol uh, By the way, that's that's stormy daniel and trump's ex-fixer that's one of the other criminal trials did did trump violate campaign finance and tax law by paying hush money and then writing it down as a business expense and not disclosing it as a campaign expense in 2016, right? So some of this goes back quite a ways. Now, now That's good. because we, we got to do this relatively quickly, let me just point to, to two things that I'm focused on in thinking about these issues. One of them is the transformation of the Republican Party. And I think at this point, it really has completely become Donald Trump's party. And, and so um, part of what I'm showing on this slide, and again, these are just slides exerted, uh, exerted from other slideshows, but, but that uh, basically less than a quarter of Republican candidates in 2022 were willing to say out loud that Joe Biden was the legitimately elected president of the United States. Roughly half of them said they reject that proposition or cast doubt on it. And, and by the way, it, 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 there's no evidence, no convincing, no verifiable, no reliable evidence that there was uh, determinative fraud fraud that determines the outcome of the election in 2020. This is made up. This is fabricated. This is conspiracy theory, cuckoo stuff. And yet one quarter of the candidates from one of our two main parties is willing to say that out loud. Three quarters are not. And then when we look at the Trump trials, and I, I think this is a huge issue for the United States, the intersection of the criminal justice system, the rule of law on the one hand, and democratic politics on the other, right? The same man who is going yeah. to be tried is also the leading candidate of one of our two main parties. And again, the majority of elected officials, before they saw the first indictments, rejected the idea that there was any basis in the law for going after Trump. That reminds me of Pakistan. In Pakistan, when the uh, when uh, the last uh, prime minister, when he lost election, everybody, uh, his entire party thinks that there was like foul doing and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so one of the things I want to point out is that in the 21st century, uh, more and more stable, mature, old democracies are becoming like the younger, less stable democracies in the sense that in particular, conservative parties seem more and more willing to use the instruments of government to persecute their opponents. And to be as clear as possible, Donald Trump is in, in this wonderful position of being able to say, well, Biden's doing that to me. I, I, I don't think there's any truth in that proposition, but please note that 56% of Republican voters are convinced that the reason that Trump is being prosecuted is not because he broke the law, or at least that there's a reasonable suspicion and a preponderance of evidence that he did, but because Joe Biden wants to keep him from representing 
them, right? So, so they're taking this personally. This is an attack on you. One more thing I want to say about what makes this possible, and I think in a sense we, we have to recognize the, the Republican Party has drifted into this very different kind of political party, a populist, anti-institutionalist, proto-authoritarian party in the 21st century, in part because the media system, the public sphere, our knowledge system are so transformed to the point where basically 60% of what is said on Fox News are most watched news network in the United States fails the scoring system for truth, right? It's, it, it's just propaganda, it's just false. MSNBC is not that much better, but Fox News is 50% worse, right? Half again as much falsehood. And so the Republican Party can go down this path in part because as opposed to the media checking it, verifying it, calling it out. This is not this is not the news uh, in print. Because no, print is this also is not like... the news in print. But but one of the things that Fox News is doing is looking at websites like Breitbart and getting its stories from these fringe websites that are, are produced. Well, New, York, New York Times is with which uh, TV station? New York Times is not with a TV station. It's an, it's its own outlet. I know, but like which, so I, I, would you say that MSNBC oh, uh, derives the, their stories from New York Times? The whole left and center media ecosystem, which includes not only the New York Times, but the Wall Street Journal, ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, those oh. stations and outlets check each other and if something false is said or published which happens obviously but if it's egregious if it's made up and then amplified the new york times abc cnn fires the journalists and the editors for a lapse of journalistic ethics fox news right there but it just paid a 750 million dollar settlement to Dominion Election Systems for libel. Rudy Giuliani just got a $150 million verdict against him for libel, right? That, that they say false things and actually they police each other for saying false things. When Fox says Trump lost the election in 2020, it loses its viewership. It gets attacked by Newsmax and Breitbart, and it has to stop saying it or else it's going to lose its market share. Oh. Here we go. Does increase in war and tensions between, between positions in Ukraine and Gaza augur the end of war, world order, and a return to anarchical states? Wow. That's a mouthful. You, what I'm, what I had like a slide for this question, which means that will old and new war accelerate and lead to an Armageddon, uh, yeah. and especially the uh, stuff that's hap that happened in 2023. And and um, I maybe I should just say, does the jungle grow back? Right, the the title of, of one of the books I like on this, um, and and yes. You know, we, we we could note that while we spend a lot of time on the Ukraine and Gaza, we are paying a little bit of attention to Sudan and Yemen, less attention to Ethiopia, which, by the way, is on the cusp of another major starvation event related to war and the government's persecution of uh, I, I, rebels in, in one region in the Ukraine, uh, to the Tigran region. I'm sorry, in Ethiopia. What we're seeing is that the old institutions, the institutions of the United Nations, the institutions of alliances, the institutions of uh, a balance of power are breaking down and, and that war is rum rumbling back 
as a major tool through which actors are pursuing their domestic and international aims. This in an era... I feel that maybe we had the same amount of war even in, uh, you know, olden times, like which is like a couple of centuries or, you know, more ago. Uh, it's just that we were, because of the sophistication of our weapons, we can kill more people. But let me show you a little bit more information about what's going on with warfare, if I can find it quickly. I'm, I'm not sure I can. One other question I would ask over here is that, have you read all the books that are in the background? That's <laughs> Uh, and and the honest answer is no. Uh, I've read a lot of them, but but not all of them. Uh, and one one should be called a retirement track where you will read those books when you retire. Well, I I think the other question is how many of those books have I read multiple times, right? And so there's some I keep returning to, some that are up there as resources. I get one thing out of them. Some that are up there. As promissory notes. So, so to answer your question, Sophia, if you look at this in terms of the number of wars, right, going back to the middle of the last millennium, and uh, on the other hand, the duration of wars, and finally, the percentage in which large powers or great powers were involved, the second half of the 20th century into the first quarter of the 21st century has seen a remarkable decline in warfare, right? So warfare used to be more prevalent for much of human history. It's been declining, and, and uh, the, the same thing is true for casualties in war. And, and there are different kinds of wars with different kinds of casualties. Um, but right whether we're looking at battlefield deaths or the number of conflicts or the deaths per 100,000 all of these have been better in the post world war 2 era better especially in the post cold war era and we're living war, longer and we're not killing each other as much as we used to we're not killing each other as much as we used to. And I just worry that we're on our way to a uh, period in which war starts to come back as, as a major tool in international relations. That seems to be what we may be witnessing with the decline of the United States as the anchor and architect of international order. Um, so 2023, the number five is the year that COVID pandemic ended and people stopped getting uh, scared of COVID. We, we, we've got over a million deaths, maybe approaching one and a half million deaths. We still have 1,500 people dying a week. We shouldn't think of this as over and done with, right? But look at the, the rate of deaths from the beginning of 2020 through the spring of 2022, right? And, and so obviously the vaccines and the growing capacity of the immune system to fight off this disease have slowed it to the point where officially this is certainly no longer a pandemic. Uh, okay. But that doesn't mean it's not still something that we need to be careful about, right? Okay. Um, and I, I want to suggest a couple questions, right? Will we learn the lessons is, is, is the big question here. Yeah. And, and, and so, look, there are other pandemics almost certainly coming our way. There are 8 billion of us on the planet. We live much more closely interspersed with animals that carry novel viruses that can cross over into humanity and there are lots of hot spots. And then I just want to do one other thing with COVID for a second. And, and look at the diagram on the left, right? The, the book on the right talks about how the COVID shutdown of the economy was the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Dwarfs, if, if you look, right, this is the 2008-2009 Great Recession. Look at how much more extreme the job loss was in 
the COVID shutdown, right? And yet, I don't think we think of this as a Great Depression. And the reason we don't think of it as a Great Depression is we passed all this legislation to assist people. And actually, during COVID, poverty came down in America for every group. And I think most importantly, right, this is, a, a, again, look at, at that. At the same time that unemployment leaves all of our previous records behind, poverty goes down in a way that shatters all of our previous records. Most importantly, childhood poverty goes way down. And, and so one of the lessons I think we learn from COVID and our response to it is we have policy tools that can succeed in helping us to fight poverty if we're serious about it. So good news, on the other hand, we ended most of those policies. We've lacked the political will to continue them. My favorite slide of all, uh, this was the year of uh, girlhood, girl power, and some really nice movies. I went back to theater. Uh, it was after COVID, uh, deserting all the cinemas. This, These, some movies and some uh, concerts brought us back to life again to see like what was what that, that life is not about just the political and um, other struggles but also in United States in some of the best um, parts of this planet uh, there was there was great art that was being produced and girls were leading the way creating uh, you know, um, I heard about Beyonce and uh, Taylor Swift coming together to give a resuscitative boost to the economy. Yeah, if you look at these three together, right? Barbie. And Bar Barbie. Yeah. Barbie. Taylor that Swift here, and Beyonce. You've got over $3 billion in yeah. economic activity associated with these three alone that moves the needle on the economy as a whole, right? And 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 so this is power. And, you know, the the, the power of the Barbie movie, I'm, I'm asking is the seeding the the new culture wars, right? You know, are, are we sowing the seeds in 2023? Because let's remember, Barbie is in many ways a subversive feminist movie dressed up as a kid's doll movie, right? And, and, and many young girls who are living in conservative states with conservative parents where they're trying to keep any kind of liberal book out of their school libraries, went to this movie dressed head to toe in pink and heard the monologue about how impossible the gender standards on women are in the United States. And then you have Taylor Swift and Beyonce performing alternative ways of thinking about gender. So, so I do wanna sneak a little bit of politics into the girl power moment. Um, last thing, right? Revelations from space, are we alone in the universe? And, 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 and so to begin with, what the Webb telescope is revealing is just how vast the galaxy is and the galaxies beyond our galaxy and how infinitesimally small we are in this scale and how improbable it is that there isn't other life out there. I think the big question, is it complex, intelligent life? And then I will point out that 2022, 2023 also sees, right, the U.S. government releasing its report about unidentified anomalous phenomena, what we used to call UFOs, right? We, we, and, and, and that there are 143 unexplained sightings in the last 20 years, um, is perhaps the universe not only being looked at by us, but taking a look at us. So one of my clients who is an astrophysicist uh, was mentioning that uh, Noah's Ark uh, did happen, uh, happen and it, but it happened on a different planet. <laughs> well, I think there's another, another explanation, and it goes back to climate change. It used to be we had periodic ice ages, ice 
shelves would form big ice dams that held huge reservoirs of water, essentially inland oceans. And when those ice dams broke, guess what? An ocean of water came surging across continents. The, the, the places that we saw in Sedona when we went there, Sophia, a lot of that rock formation may have been carved by one of those giant floods unleashed by the ending of an ice age, right? So, so there, are enough, there are other possible scientific explanations. When, I, when we went to the, uh, the uh, California where, we, uh, where I saw the whales, uh, the, for the first time, the marine biologists told us that the right underneath that surface is our canyons, almost as big as the Grand Canyons, and uh, that's where the whales come to now uh, feed. Uh, Mon Monterey Bay. Bay off the Santa Cruz coast. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah Sophia was, was lucky enough. I was presenting a paper in a conference and she was out on the ocean and she saw 40 whales up close, right? A, I, a I, I smell it. So in yeah. 2020 was the year where I smelt a whale fart. Yeah. Yeah. Not a fart, oh. right? Hopefully, yeah, it, was, it, was the it felt like rotten anchovies. Yes. So thank you so much. These were this was great. I am so happy that we were able to do it. So thank uh, you for doing. It. And that's it. I'll talk bye, to everybody. you. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.